Good evening. My name is Joe Bonamassa, and welcome to The Conversation. My special guest today is a man with a hell of a story to tell. <laughs> Just your, one. <laughs> your friend and mine, Mr. Terry Reed, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Terry, Joe. Terry, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure, boy. It's always good to see you, yeah. This yeah. feels like one of those old style, like, you know, Mike Wallace sets, you know, yeah, I, you, know Wallace, you know, yeah. like with the long cigarettes <laughs> and the yeah. tobacco heads. Yeah, we can't smoke now though, can you? Everybody, you look back at them things, everybody smoked, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now, now it's, nah. we just have a table and a couple of magnetons. Uh, How have you um, been? I've been good. I've been good. God bless you. I've been well. Like I see all of, all of our friends here have all been well as well, you know, and you and it's, it's rough. What a year. What a year. I mean, how, do you, how have you yeah. been uh, keeping busy? Have you been writing songs? Have you yeah. been recording? No, I've been the thing of writing. I started, I've been working on things. I mean, usually if I write, I know how you are yourself, but is I don't force myself to write. If I get an idea, I'll work on it. Right, you know, and uh, and uh, once something starts going, I'll keep going on it, right? But I've, I've been, ironically, a funny thing I've been doing is all these Western songs I've loved for years, right? Like uh, 310 to Yuma and uh, My Rifle, My Pony and Me, <laughs> you know, all these things that we saw in movies for years and years as kids. That I said, suddenly I start to see them in a, in a, a, a bit of a different way. I thought, you know what, you could re revisit them and uh, I'm going to say modernise them, you don't modernise them, but you can just change the arrangements. And as long as you, you're really sincere about them, uh, we'll see what happens. And I've done a bunch of them, done all the harmonies myself, more like, how would you say, the, the harmonies are, yeah, it's more like Sons of the Pioneers, some of the background, right. and some are more like the Mills Brothers. <laughs> right. Using like real low, real low voice in there, like five part harmony. And they come out really, some of them coming out really good. So it's, that, a, it's a passion that. You that's know. exciting. You know, I've known you for a long time and I've been a fan for longer than that. Oh, and oh. I will say this some of my favorite songs to come out of the 60s, you were part of Seed of Memory, Tinker uh. Taylor. You know, when you first started... Tinker start Taylor, yeah? yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, when, yeah. You, when you first started, what was, the, what was the gateway that got you into music? What, 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 what started the journey? Was it... Was the it journey, your... yeah. It started that thing. Well, I think like you, you with guitars, you know, we're incurable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you bring a guitar in and you immediately got our attention, right? Well, the thing is with, with songs, when I was... We high, you know. I, don't, I was like a, a radio sponge. I, I, I'm thinking of a way of putting it. it. You'd sing a song once to me, or play me a song on the radio once, and for some reason I'd absorb the whole thing. Right. If I liked it, only if I liked the song. Right. Right. When I was really, we were a lot younger, when I was like seven, eight years old, I'd pick out, I don't know what this was. It's it, it, something about everybody has their own things that they like, right? I could never be forced into doing this or that, you know, I mean, different pop songs, right? I, the one thing I love to sing more than anything and still do is, is uh, from uh, My Fair Lady uh, on the street where you live. Yeah. And I used to sing that at seven years old. I wish I had a tape of it to see how bad it was. Because <laughs> then I could see where I was going, you know. But uh, growing up, it, it, it was just, Different music sort of really, in, I don't know, really interested me. Like growing up, a lot of the, more of the jazz things and uh, all different kinds of scat singers, you know, King Pleasure and Eddie Jefferson and, uh, and uh, all those very unusual things, right? When did you realize you had a voice? Now there's lots of singers. Yeah, I know. I, I, I never really thought about it. I mean, I know that sounds a bit pompous, but what I'm saying is, uh, I'd love to sing, and I always looked at it, well, if I can pull that off, maybe right. I can sing that one, because that one's a hell of a sight tougher than that one, right? right. And I go from one thing to another and get really stoked. I get really lit up that I could sing, because you know, I'd listen back to what we just, before you record anything, of right. course, right? So, and you don't really hear yourself, because when you're doing something, you're not listening anyway, right? But I'd play back the thing that I know I just nailed, right? And I go, 
you know what, I think I'm pretty good. I think I might be able to do this, you right. know. Um, and uh, my, da my dad was always, he's like very supportive. He was, uh, I mean, he was very stern about, yeah, yeah, well, you've got a long way to go. It's one of them deals, right? You know? He's a car salesman, so it's like, you know, don't, don't get too attached to that car. It's for sale. <laughs> right. That's his whole ethic, right? My dad yeah. is a natural contrarian. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, there's exactly. always a counterpoint to everything. There is, there is. There is yeah. You know, when who discovered you in England? I mean, like, you know, like you're popping around, you're in bands, you're yeah. you're, you're, you're you're touring. I mean, you were you were on tour with the Rolling Stones in what, sixty six? Yeah, sixty six, sixty five, sixty six. Yeah, I had my sixteenth birthday on the tour. How right. cool is that? Well, it was mad. Well, because it, 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 it was a screamer tour, which we all know about now. We've all seen Shea Stadium and God and all these. And we've seen all these riots in the street where, you know, there's, there's millions of women with scissors trying to cut your hair off, you know. And think, that's that side, you know. It's right. not too much fun, all that. <laughs> right. You know. But that went on for quite a long time, you know. So you never heard anything that you did. You know, that's where the Beatles got really pissed off because they, they do, good evening, that was the end of it. Never heard it. It was just your ears would shut down, you know. But, you know, to me, what, what, what strikes me about the Beatles and yourself and the Stones <laughs> well, and, and, yeah. and, and, and all of the, those singers of that generation, yeah, right. how remarkably in tune you are. Thank you. And, that's, and a, that's a really you know, good company. Because yeah. now we have the we have the advantages of having, you know, yeah, in ear monitors shift. and, and, and <laughs> yeah. you know, wedges that are that are louder than the PAs were back in the late sixties. Yeah. I mean, but all of your class had a remarkable pitch center. You can't teach somebody to sing in tune. Right. I, I don't think that's really possible. You could if they've got a voice, you could improve on their breathing. And, and to, I never really, you know, I never had training, but it, it, the things you do learn over the years that, you know, right. help you do certain things. And songs, say you write a song and you want to do this, you've got to really ponder the whole idea in your head of where you're going to breathe without really concentrating on breathing. You, it should never be seen that you're breathing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, it sounds a bit, what are you going to do if you don't breathe? Uh, yeah. One of the things I, I always noticed, you know, like about real singers, like I'm a guitar player who sings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not a singer who plays guitar. I'm, there's a difference. Is, you know, just down the street, there's East West Studios from this location. And there's some great photos of Sinatra standing in the middle of the room right. with a full orchestra, you know, and conducted friends. Yeah, and, fr and friends <laughs> yeah, conducted by ones, you yeah. know, you know, con you know, on Capitol and conducted by Nelson Riddle. That's right. And there's a microphone right over his head and nothing else. That's it. And that stuff goes down direct to disc like that. Yeah. Do you think technology and the ability to tune things, manipulate sound? Yeah actually does more harm to an artist than good, given the fact that the price of admission is a little bit less, going, I don't really have to quite sing it as good because it can be tuned and moved as opposed to, you need to nail this because the orchestra's costing you tons of money, the studio's costing you tons of money. Do you really, do you feel that having that, that trial by fire training yeah. is still trial valuable? Trial by fire training, right. that's really good, yeah. Well, it is trial by fire. And it's what you learn coming up in the ranks, that you, you, that you learn those things. That this, this, okay, there's two things right, that we know so well. You go to the studio, you know already that you can do it over again. I, I never will do it on a, on a song, no more than three mm -hmm. of that song in a day. I'll move to another song. Right. Three's, I got my limits, right. my limitations, <laughs> right? So just because if I haven't, I make myself a rule, if I haven't got it in three, and that's it. I mean, I usually don't go that far, it's usually two. But if I haven't got it in three, uh, or something that is structured enough that you might punch a little here, or you use something from one and some from two, uh, you have, right. just pop back and forth. I worked with Trevor Horn. Yes. Doing an album called Driver, right, which you, have not heard. <laughs> it, uh, most of my albums, they weren't released, they escaped, right? right. <laughs> Different concept, you see, right? But we work, we work, with, we work with Trevor. And uh, now Trevor is your articulate uh, digital person that will look at every note 
and every word and everything you do, which is it's nice that he ponders it that much. The only thing is, you can suck the breath out of the whole thing if you're not careful. You can you, that thing we call soul or passion and feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy with all the technology to suck all that out because you can you can slope and shape a word and and a breath. And it, you know, we were just talking yeah. about learning how where you breathe. So you does it look like you're breathing, right? right. All that goes right out the window. So you've got to, you've got to be very careful if you digitally. I mean, I, I just maintain that if you're going to sing a song, uh, you could call it practice or rehearsing or pre-production if you want to be a little, you know, if right. there's a budget involved. <laughs> right. You know, it's pre-production. Is just take your time and learn it on your own. Then there's a, something that happens then is, it becomes you and it becomes yours. Right. If you learn it on your own. If you just, I don't know, if you just ram it and then try and change it in the studio and then somebody says that horrible word, we'll get it in the mix. I mean, don't ever mention that. <laughs> I mean, oh, I'm leaving, I'm gone then. But you, you, we both understand that, you know. With singers, they, they try a little too much to make them either flavor of the month or sound-wise, or they, they try and stylize them into something, and they don't give the poor guy a chance to really be who he is emotionally coming out of there, you know? What's your standard for writing a song in the, in the, in the sense that does it have to work just completely naked with, with an acoustic guitar That's and a, a voice point. and the structure and everything works like that, no, or do you not... envision it for full band? Ah, uh, okay, two things. It's two things. There's a song like Seed of Memory. Yes, one of my mentioned. favorites. All right, well, that is something that is unto itself. It's got all these moving parts that are all over the place. It's in the strangest tuning, you know, <laughs> and it's moving all the time. And what it is, is you're playing it solo. It's a solo song. But what you're playing has nothing to do with the singing part. The, the timing of the guitar and what you're playing is here, doing this, right. and the singing is over there. Right. You, you separate, you, you learn over the years to separate what you're playing from what you're singing. It's very similar as to a, a lead vocalist with a band. Right. You could do what the hell you like then because, you know, as long as they stick to it, right? Then that's that kind of song. Then you add the instrumentation. The other one is if you're writing... R&B songs are really true. You listen to James Brown, you listen to Six, right? And it's, it's a machine. Yeah, right? Yeah. Sex machine, yeah. It's, that's what it is. It's a machine. Everything is, is a little, they're little piece, pieces put together that make a whole. Right. Right. And it's not just James Brown. It could be the Beatles or whoever it is, you know. They, the Beatles work the same way, you know. It's just fascinating to me how they... There's four guys. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> this is so good. You listen to the BBC recordings, you know, when they were live on the radio, and they go, thank you very much. Oh, that was live. <laughs> right. It's pretty scary. But they, fig they sit, spend a lot of time sitting down figuring out who's going to play what and where you're going to sing. They're just very good at what they do, you know. Do you find that's valuable in a pre-production sense? Yeah. Or, or, do, or do you use the studio as a tool? Because a lot of people use the studio I've as a tool. That. I've done that. I've done that. I've gone in the studio and, and experimented. And as much <laughs> you got me there, as much as you say, I'm going to rehearse myself on this. I'm going to be so good. It's going to be so perfect. We'll only do one take and that's it. Right? As yeah. much as you say that, as soon as you walk in, a certain studio, like I don't have to tell you because you were Abbey Road with mm. the guitar. You sent me that picture yes, of, that's right. of Terry at Abbey Road. <laughs> that's right. Where, where I, I, I've recorded there myself and at Capitol as well. And certain studios, Olympic was another one. You'll walk in and as much as you've got all oh, this in your head, when you get, if it's a situation where you said like with, with Mr. Sinatra where he, He's got one mic in front of him and all this orchestra and everything going on. And he just, bam, now he just goes for it. Because he was a real one-take guy, you know, scarily enough, really. And, uh, but when you walk in, 
the, the room has an effect on you. That Abbey Road is mm -hmm. such a, a sounding room. That, that was it B, that big room. Yeah. We used Studio A. Right. And a lot of times when people were, they're asking me now because the album is coming out, it's like, what, were you overwhelmed by being in the studio? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. As, a, as a fan and a historian and a musicologist, yeah. I fancy myself a musicologist, I, I go, yeah. And by the way, Abbey Road is happy to show you or rent you the console that Dark Side of the Moon was recorded yeah, on. Yeah, right, right. Show you the, the you know, the, 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 the microphone that John Lennon sang, you know, uh, Revolution. Yeah, right, yeah. And the piano that's the Lady Madonna piano. Yeah. And, and they were showing me all this stuff. And I'm like, as a guitar geek, I'm like geeking out. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, and I went to the one guy and I said, you know, the one thing that all of this won't do? And he's like, what? Because it's like hallowed ground. I go, yeah. Write those songs. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the microphone. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, tell me about um, tell me about Graham Nash, your relationship with oh, Graham Nash. God. Because that yeah. name pops up in your career and your trajectory. Well, a yeah. lot. You, you you said earlier what you said that you one of those things, not to revert, but it was what what gave you the idea? <laughs> that you thought you could see in the first place, or oh, one of them deals, right? You know, or what made you think well, it takes somebody else that you look up to? I think, right? right? The out of the blue says without any provocation, right? Says, yeah, you, you, you know, you're really good, or you, you're really good at this. You, you should do this more, or something. And the thing is, is I, you know, coming up with, as you know, the Beatles and the Stones and that. Um, and earlier on, right in that first, when I went out with the Stones and things, I, I, when I was in a, a how would you say, it, an amateur band, mm -hmm. when we started, you know, right. garage band, whatever you call it, is when we all started, what we'd do is we'd play behind supporting all the major groups that would come through town. Right. right? And we'd play with the searchers. Uh, oh, we're not the zombies, or not all these. So you get to know all these guys. Mm -hmm. They were lovely guys, great guys. You felt like you were part of something. And then we did. I remember it. It was a place called Ramsey, near where I live in England, in Cambridgeshire. I can remember right. it. And, and Graham remembers the night as well. And I was fourteen. He says I'm fourteen. I thought I was fifteen. Right? And uh, uh, we did a gig with the Hollies, mm -hmm. and I could not believe. Here we go again with that Beatle thing, right? right. You know, the, you said about how in tune people are. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about a, a, a group that is so in tune, you sort of don't believe they're doing this all live. There's, hang on a minute, let me, I went afterwards and I looked behind the amps. Mm -hmm. I, like some scoreboard, looking, going, you know, see, they've got to have some of that American stuff in there. Got some, they got some plugins and they got mm -hmm. some, Echo chat and this, that, and the other. And this guy comes walking out from the window and says, Hey, like, this is Graham. He said, What are you doing? I said, oh, I was just looking behind the amps. I said, you, you, How did you sound that good? I said, What other what stuff have you got in here? He says, What? He said, They're straight amps. <laughs> right. I said, You're joking, right? So we went and told the whole band. I know I felt a bit silly at that. And he said, what are you worried about? You were great. You were really good singer. And he became really friendly and real warm. Right. And I think that really, I, I really inspired me because I got all the records. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that is right. I was sitting, I got all the records and suddenly he sort of treated me just like one of the guys. And he always calls me Tex, right? right? Which I never had a hat then. I don't know. And apparently in Liverpool and Manchester, that's a, a term of endearment. I didn't know that till years later. But well, I mean, how, does it, how did it feel like a band like the Hollies? They, they covered your song without expression. I, well, I was a bit later, you see. Uh, Graham, yeah, I know, but that was like, I mean, after like. After that, Graham gave me a Les, well, he sold me for very little, uh, uh, that Les Paul over there, but a black one with the P90s on it. Yeah. Uh, he sold me it for 300 quid. He said, You need a really good guitar, mate. He says, Here, I got one. I got a great guitar for you. Right? I was a kid, so Les Paul. And I go, are you serious? He said, do you love it? It's great. Put some new strings on. Away we go, right? Then we do some more things. And uh, I did a bunch of things with the Hollies. Then I did some tunes at Abbey Road, right? Mm -hmm. Like basically demoing, right? With John Martin, who was their producer. Right. right. 
Like Graham hooked me up with that. Then we became really good friends and we started writing things together, right? And uh, while he was with the Hollies, you know. Then he, then he turns around one day and he says, uh, well, um, we I tell you, Terry, we've got Top of the Pops tonight, you know, and everything, right? Uh, but I've got to tell you before we go down there, he says, I'm leaving the Hollies. I went, you're what? <laughs> you can't, right. you're the leader of the band, you can't lead the Hollies. Mm -hmm. He said, look, don't know, it's already, it. I said, do they know you? I said, no, I'm going to tell them tonight. I went, oh, great, I don't really want to be around when that's going on, right? So consequently, he, uh, he told me about, he said, I said, who's in the band? He said, well, uh, you know the Buffalo Springfield? I said, no, I haven't heard of him, mate. He goes, you don't know Neil Young? I went, no. And he says, Stephen Stewart? I said, no. He said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. These are American bands. I haven't been over there. <laughs> right. well, I don't know what's going on. And I said, who else is in the band? He says, well, David Crosby. I said, oh, that's okay. You can join the band. <laughs> right, right. That's fine then, you know. Because to me, they were very tuneful. The Birds were another band like the English bands were very tuneful. So to me, I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> yeah. He laughs about that, you know. But, but yeah, with Graham, we've been friends through all of this. Years. Years. And I, years and years. And all the, all the transitions and Crosby, Stills and Nash. I was, I was actually, I was sitting thinking the other day, I was looking at that album cover that Henry Diltz did, you know, with him sitting on the couch. Right. And I was at the rehearsals when they started up in Sag Harbor in New York. That was really interesting. You saw a, a new thing. Yes, what's new? There's nothing new. I mean, you saw this culmination of something going on that was very different, yet it was a blend of a lot of things that you liked. All the folk music, all the country music, all the this, all the bit of rock and roll, R&B, <laughs> all this, and this, blah, and you've got all these guys in the room. And... Dave Crosby had just finished the, the reprise record with Joni Mitchell, right? Right. And he turned up there and they started rehearsing. And so Joni was there, nothing to do with this gang, right? right. No. She was, I don't know who Joni Mitchell is, right? Nobody really did it. That, she hadn't, the record hadn't come out, right? right? And Judy Collins is there, who I, I knew, who was going with Stephen and that. So there's a whole gang of all these people, a guy, Tom Ross, who's another guy who's a great, great player. I love right. Tom. And you had a culmination of all these people, and Fuzzy Sam is on bass, and, and uh, Dallas Taylor. So we, I would hang out there for like a week, getting all involved. And the one thing that stuck in my mind that Graham said he's going to give me a copy of, which I, I've got to have, is six, seven part harmony of Blackbird in this bathroom there. They had a, a, a toilet bathroom area there. It was really echo, and they'd rehearse, they'd practice songs, the harmonies right. in there, right? right? And one day they did Blackbird, I, it floored me. I net in, it was like a chorale version of Blackbird. Right. I mean, Paul is free, I mean, I don't know if Paul ever got a touch, but it was magnificent, you know. Graham, he's promised me, that's something, there's always something going on with me, yeah. You know, one of the things about super groups, and there's yeah. been plenty of them, you know, yeah. is, you know, sometimes one plus one plus one equals ten, like yeah. with Crosby, Stills, and yeah. Nashville four. Yeah, you know, that and, worked. And yeah, right. That worked. And then sometimes one plus one <laughs> plus one equals nightmare. Zero. <laughs> nightmare. Zero. No, yeah, that that whole thing of like Blind Faith, or an Eric did Blind Faith. Yeah. I know they did an album, and look at it, you've got Steve Wimmer and you got Ginger, that redhead. Rick uh, Breck on bass. Oh yeah, Rick Breck on bass. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but. Everybody who was very, very good, but everybody in there is, is brilliant, you know. Mm -hmm. The one thing when they did the Hyde Park gig, mm -hmm. right, well, you love yeah. this one, right? So they're going to play the first gig in Hyde Park in London. It's big, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, right? And they, they'd never done a gig, right? right? You know, you come, go from the studio with overdubs, you God knows what, and you're all worried about, well, is that just Eric's thing, or is just this one line going to suffice with all the overdubs that I yeah. put on. <laughs> yeah. Right? You worry about their things. So they get out to the high Park, and the roadies all get there, and they set all the gear up. Eric turns up and goes, where's, where's Steve Hammond? And he went, oh, it's back over there. <laughs> right. right. The one thing they hadn't figured out, Steve Wynn would never like at that point, he never, with Spencer Davis, he, he, when we used to do gigs, he'd never liked the Hammond organ up front. He's like, no way. Right. He's, Steve, don't, he's not the big limelight. He doesn't like to be the big limelight guy, you know. 
he, he likes to play and have fun and get it done, you know. He likes either on the side or in the back. So they set his hand and organ way in the back. And Eric is out front on his own. <laughs> and it sort of did, it didn't work. You're wondering where the voice is coming from all the time. Right? And plus the record was predominantly mid-tempo material, which yeah. doesn't really play well to a gigantic crowd. You know, I mean, you know, it was just... Blind faith, you know, yeah. it's sort of very aptly named. You know? Okay, good transition. Tell me yeah. about your relationship with Eric, and in particular, yeah. um, not a lot of people know this, but I do. Um, you were the support act for Cream on their farewell tour yeah. of the United States. Yeah, it was Cream and Terry Reid. And, yeah, and no, it's tell me, tell me, tell me what that, what it was, what it was like touring with. I mean, because at that point one of the first arena bands. I mean, everybody's making this stuff up as they go, right. as they go along. What was that like to be part of that, that kind of inertia and that, that kind of tour? Yeah, well, I had never, I'd never been to New York, mm -hmm. A. B, I'd heard of Madison Square Garden because mm -hmm. I saw Muhammad Cassius Clay, or Muhammad Dali, whatever you, right. right? I'd seen him fight that damn Sonny Lister, those amazing fights, right? right? You know, so you see all that. And you see that place. And then somebody, Eric says, do you want to do this tour with us? And uh, I said, yeah, I'd love to, you know, where are we going? He said, America. I said, are you kidding? I haven't been to America. This is it, right? I've got, we've done it. we got it. Right. And he said, yeah. He said, but I'll tell you what. He said, management are a bit funny. You know how managers are, Terry? Because me and Eric, I've known Eric for quite a while. Right. Since it's John Mayall, you know. Right. Right? Or, he said, so... Don't take it to heart, he said. But if you get a phone call from the management saying, we, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be going on this tour, and insulting the friggin' hell out of you or something, don't take it serious. He said, look, there's two phone numbers. There's a rotation number and another, you can get a hold of me, call me. Right. And he, don't say anything, just say yes, sir. And he called me, he said, I'll sort it out. Right? And I went, what the hell does this mean? I get a phone call. From Stiggy's boys and all right. that, you know. Robert uh, Stigwood for Robert, those. Who, Robert Stigwood, who, sorry, yeah. yeah. There you go. And uh, who sort of means well is to, I suppose, you know. He's a but manager. He's a manager. Like right? Peter so, Grant was a manager. Yeah, right? but yeah, yeah, but you just belt your one. Right. It'd be very simple. <laughs> At the time, he was my manager. Peter Grant? Yeah. Oh, so well, then. you weren't going to get belted, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that was managed by, by him at the time. So, what happens is that uh, he called up, you shouldn't be on this tour. Terry, I've looked at your set list. You don't play any blues songs, right? And I said, what do you mean? I play a bunch of R&B and I do summertime blues and, uh, and uh, you, what's it, the Ray Charles one, you know. Um, you, 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 oh, anyway, there, there was a blues in there and a the boss and over there. <laughs> anyway, I've got, I'm a mixture of everything, right? right. And I said, why, what's wrong with that? He said, oh, no, you shouldn't really be honest. It's a blue, the cream are a blues band. I said, what? I said, a blues band? I said, well, when Eric was with John Mayall, maybe, yeah, maybe it was blues going somewhere. Him and mm -hmm. Peter Green took it another place, true. Right. But this, the, the cream, I said, this is like a 2,000 watt violinist. What are you talking about? <laughs> I said, is it as loud as that? Is it, I said, it's never that loud. Right. And... Uh, so anyway, I said, well, look, you know, you do whatever you want and this, that, and the other, and let me know. And I put the phone down, and then I got hold of Eric, and Eric said, see, I told you they'd try and get rid of you. So right up until taking the flight the next one. Now, this is the first time I've got a big shot at doing something. <laughs> they tried to get rid of you already. So right. thanks to Eric. Who, as you, you know Eric, right? He's just yeah. a, a lovely guy. He's a real gentleman. I owe him a debt of gratitude that Such, I would never be able to repay for what he right. did for me in 2009. Yeah. So tell, yeah. tell the folks how you and I met initially back in 2014. <laughs> now, I preface this because I know this is, this, yeah. is a, this is a Gibson program. We met because um, I, um, I'm lucky enough to be the custodian of one of Terry's <laughs> guitars and that, let's just say, rhymes with the word blender. Yeah, it and, does. It and, does rhyme like that. Yeah. And it don't look like it. But. <laughs> no, it doesn't look like it. Um, but we we met um, a long time ago, and yeah. at the time when I when I when I purchased the guitar from you, 
Um, I had a friend that uh, I was on the phone with, and, and she was like, she's like, what, what are you going to do this week? I'm like, well, I'm going to go out and see Terry Reed. That's right. Yeah. And, and That's right. We had a mutual friend. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was going to go out and see Terry Reed. And, and she's, like, she's like, oh, my God, I love Terry Reed. And her introduction to you was from a movie, um, The Devil's Rejects. Devil's Rejects. That's right. Yeah. Because she worked with... Um, uh, what's he saying? Well, with Lionsgate, yeah. Yeah, and 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 the thing is, the the point is, and it was directed by Rob Zombie. Yes, right. So, what is it like um, to have a younger generation of fans <laughs> discovering you through movie and soundtrack? Yeah. You know, I mean, that well, may have I... not may have not got there on their own, but because you're in this soundtrack to an influential movie done by. Uh, Rob Zombie. Uh, Rob, yeah, because he is a bit, he's, yeah, it's a, it's a whole other demographic, as you might say. Yeah. And he's a big fan. He's used your songs in oh, many he's got, I mean, I've, I'm, I've seen him a lot. We've got together a lot. Yeah, I went to the premiere of the last one, which he had a bunch of my songs in as well. And he's a lovely, him and his wife, a great guy. Right. Now, when we first did that thing with the movie, mm -hmm. right, uh, it was a guy, Joel High, that's mm -hmm. his name. He was running Lionsgate uh, Film Company at the time. So Joe says, uh, come down here. He says, I've got a great idea. We're doing this movie. Where he says, you, you know Rob Zombie? I said, yeah, oh, I've heard him. You have him out. God, he's great. He makes great records, great sounding records, great mixes and all. Right. He said, well, he's looking for a couple of, he's looking for a song, one song in his movie that will fit this place. And he doesn't want to use... Born to be wild, or <laughs> right. everybody's used a, or, or an eagle song. Everybody's used. He wants to do something from the genre, but not something that significant. Yes. Right? And I went, oh, well, I've got a couple here, right? He said, but he's a big fan of see the memory album. Right. Joel is. Yeah. I come down there, and he says, right. Well, by the time I got down there, he'd seen Joel and he'd played him see the memory the album, and he'd gone home with it that night. And when I got down there, he said, well, guess what's happened? I said, what? He said, well, I sent him home with Seed of Memory, my copy. You better come back with it, right? <laughs> he said, but I, he called me up. He wants three of the songs in his movie. I said, I thought he needed one. He said, he wants three. I said, he said, you, you'll get a ton of money. <laughs> and right. I'm, he says, I'm paying you. <laughs> right. I said, well, this is fantastic. So... I didn't meet Joe, uh, thing. I had no idea. He didn't tell me what the movie was about. Or <laughs> no. So I take all the family when the movie comes out to go and see the movie and see, see where my song is and everything. I didn't make it through the whole movie. There was so much fun. I, I had no idea what the movie was about. Right. And it was real funny. I told Rob, he cracked up. He thought that was funny. <laughs> he said, oh, he didn't tell you what it was. I said, well, would it have made a lot of difference? <laughs> I don't right. know. You, know. You, were, you were at one of the first Glastonbury festivals. Oh, the first, yeah. The very first one, yeah. 71, right? Yeah. And there's a very famous video, and now this is for the audience who, who knows of a modern-day Glastonbury with, right. with, you know, just uh -huh. get your wellies on and, yeah, the, you know, your Instagram photo the, ops. It's the battle of the psalm with music. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's just a mud field. Yeah, right. And, it's, but... Primitive Glastonbury was a lot. It looked a lot different. There's an extraordinarily great video of the song Dean, right? And um, you you kind of go out. It looks like it's the middle of the afternoon. You walk yeah, out there, is, yeah. and you got the, the you got yeah. the blender guitar, yeah. and <laughs> the uh, blender. <laughs> it looks and, like it's been through one. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. It does. It's worse now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, and in your band, right. Um, one, one of which I, I knew for years, but, but I learned something new today, was um, a very young David Lindley yeah. on, on, on steel guitar. Right. And, your, and your drummer at the time, who was smoking what, what we call an adult cigarette, Alan White, yeah. from most famously from the band Yes. Right. And, you know, it's one of those things where... Later on, right. Later on, yeah, yeah. Right. Later on, he joined the band, yes. Yeah, right, yeah. And he's known more as a prog drummer, but he's a great, funky drummer. Unbelievable. And so when you're putting a band together like that, you know, like, how did you discover David Lindley? Yeah, now, this is... This is oh, you want to know this? Oh, yeah. there, this is unbelievable. I get... 
There's a friend of mine, Chesley Milligan, who's a right. managerial, he's a good friend of mine, but he, he worked with the Grateful Dead and the Stones and, that, yeah. and the whole deal. So we, the Stones, are all, we all know each other real well. So, and Chesley's part of an Irish horse breeder, his mother, Gigi's and all that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Seriously, big time. And uh, so he says, I got just the guitar player you need, right? Because it's just me and Lee Miles. Lee Miles started, he came over with Ike and Tina Turner. Right. And we did a gig together with I did support in Ike and Tina at the Revolution Club. They insisted on having me on in, on the gig, which I was I was just come on over the yeah. moon because I played the, with the Stones tour when I was fifteen, sixteen, right. and they remembered me. Right. <laughs> come was, on, yeah, right. The famous, the famous tour where and they opened they up. had a bass player playing with them, and my jaw dropped. It's you know we all the Chuck Rainey, uh, mm. you know James Jameson. Chuck was, you know, yeah, the the definitive R and B bass player, right? right the, that style. If only I could get somebody like that with the songs I was writing and things. It's, it's heaven. Right. It's heaven. And there he was. Right. right. I got him to leave I and Tina Turner, right? And he moved to England with me. Right. So we put the band together. The only thing was every drummer we, we auditioned 28, 30, 32 drummers in England, more or less everybody. They all wanted to play with Lee, but they couldn't cut it. He beat them up bad. It's terrible. <laughs> he beat them up. So uh, I think Stuart Copeland and Alan White were the only two that really wow. it was war. It was war, right. right? So Alan came up, and funny enough, he comes from Newcastle, where my dad's from up there. And uh, so it's sort of a, it was a family thing as well. He loved it, right? Then Chesley says... The guy you need on guitar is David Lindley. I said, well, who's that? He said, well, I'll show you. He just sent me a letter. <laughs> Lindley sent me a letter. Oh, yes. I am David Lindley and a caricature picture of himself. He does great, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Hanna-Barbera. He could have been worked for them. Right. Right? Anyway, he does this whole picture thing and he says, I would love to come to England and join your band, please. Uh, just say yes and I'll ship my instruments. And then the list is rolls out and out and out and out <laughs> and out until it hits the floor and he's writing small. It's like 123 instruments. Mm -hmm. Sars and oud right. and it's some of the most bizarre things you ever heard of in your life. And so I went, you know what? We could get a good deal shipping mm -hmm. with this company called Harrison Shipment company on, on boats and that, right? And we shipped a lot. And David, well, right. he flew over. <laughs> right. <laughs> we didn't put him on yeah, the you boat. put him in the case. No, I didn't yeah, put right. him in the case. But he was, uh, to this day, he's, you know, probably one of the best musicians, musicians I've ever heard in my life. He, he has a depth of, of Eastern music and any different Japanese music and uh, African music. He just can really digest it all. And, and all the quarter tone consciousness, you know, right. which it really takes to, you know, to do. So we had the perfect band. Right. And I think once when Alan joined the band, he says, we, we might have a, a bit of a problem with the gigs because we got a whole string of gigs, right? He said, I'm doing another project. He said, but I think we can work it out. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, I'm working with John Lennon. <laughs> and we're sitting there going, Oh, well, that's screwed right, up. Right, right, right. <laughs> we thought we, it was all going really good. Now uh, the, the whole deal was off. He said, no, no, John's a real, he's a good guy. You know, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to John because we got this one gig in particular, Leicester, uh, that we cancelled twice on because he hadn't got the band together and things, right? right? And it was booked. And three times you're out, you know. Yeah. Them, uh, you know we all know that one, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said to him, wow, well, you know, we got to do that gig. So we're sitting there one night, the phone rings, and my dad picks it up. We're over there watching a soccer game, a football game. Or and uh, the phone rings, the dad goes and picks it up. He's talking away. And he comes and he says, you better get on there. John Lennon wants to talk to you. I went, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, well, get on there. So I go talking to him, and John says, oh, he says, look, I'll let Alan go. I'll send him up in a car tomorrow. Right? And you've got to do that gig in Leicester. If you don't do that, he says, could it happen to your band? He said, what happened to ours? And you get blackballed. He says, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> and I went, yeah, your band, right? Oh, the Beatles. Right, right. <laughs> he suddenly dawned on me what he was talking about, right? 
But he was absolutely, he was a real, the way he put it was a real gem. Oh, we don't want to happen. What happened to Air Bam? We often got in trouble with that one on the road. But <laughs> just like a real yeah. working class hero, you know. Since and, this is a Gibson uh, program, um, Tell the folks a little bit about your Les Paul, the one you got from Graham Nash. It was a 55 or 56? 52. 52? Yeah, it's a 52. It's like that it's gold like top. that gold top. Okay. And that's a 52, 54. Okay. That's, it's a combination, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, but it's a combination. The original 52 of that, it's exactly the same, but it had the flying tail piece, which when you hit a chord, it'd fly across. And, right. And then you hit one of them and come back again. <laughs> and, and then you had you had a, a Les Paul Custom, a black one, which I believe is on the cover of uh, Super Lungs. Or yeah, one that's of the, the one. Yeah. Now, it's that guitar, but it was refinished. it's a one-off black. Oh, one-off black. It must have been done by the factory, because you know with the beading around the outside, that would have been ruined. Right, right. right. So it must have been factory black. I've yeah. never seen another black one. And, I, and I, I remember you, 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 you tell me the guitar was stolen. <gasps> Oh, at the Fillmore East in New York. Right. They, un they went up. You know, in New York, you always have those things that go upside of the building, the, the fire, fire escape thing. Yeah. And then uh, you get to the button and you go down and you get off, right? right. And you pull the chain there, yeah. right? Yeah. So somebody had got up on the outside of the building. It was a crafty inside job because mm -hmm. Bill Graham had great security. Yeah. Even without the angels. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> he wouldn't go there. Right. So, uh, we, we're in the dressing room and we go on stage and I was using the the blender guitar. Right. right. You know. the, 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 and, uh, the blender. Yeah. Uh, that blender, right. So and I'm going on there and uh, I left the Gibson in the case there and going, okay, we'll deal with that later. Right? Come back, went to leave and picked the guitar case up and it went. Now, we all know when there isn't the Les Paul in there because right. it weighs a ton, right? So I went, oh, God, what? And what they'd done, they'd come up outside the building on the fire escape. They had somebody inside, unscrewed the air, the vent, uh, mm -hmm. the air conditioning unit, mm -hmm. right? Took the screws out, right? Passed the guitar through, put it back on and screwed them on. And we sat there trying to figure, how did they get it out of here? And we're looking, looking. Now, Rody, Johnny, he looked and he went, I got it. And you saw two little, you saw two piles on the floor of dust where they'd unscrewed the, the screws. So they saw like two little piles. And he went, they've unscrewed the thing. And he went and the screws were loose. <laughs> so we knew. But I got to scream at Bill Graham like hell for once, just once. In a full singer's voice, I would imagine. Right, right there. Right. And I'll tell you what. Never I, again. I'll tell you what. I'm not, I'm not a detective. I don't, I don't fancy myself a detective, I, but I do, mm. as my, my career fallback, I, I would have joined the FBI. I, 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 like, <laughs> really? I, I like the idea of investigating. You like, For, I like men in black sort of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. I like forensics. Right. <laughs> when you tell me the story about when you pick up the case and it was empty because you knew how light it yeah. was, it tells me, because I, I, I am one, right. that a real New Yorker did not steal your guitar because a real New Yorker would have left two bricks in the case and went out the back uh, yeah, door. Yeah, this is very good. The clever thing to do because you'd have, you'd have been back in England before you'd known, because we'd have shipped the guitars out. It's very true. That's, they used, they used I never to, thought of that. They used to sell VCRs in Times Square for, yes. for, for $25, and you'd pick them up, and they were very convenient. It was two right. bricks. That's, That's right. right. Damn. You got me. Terry. You know, all that I, time, I never thought of that. Yeah. I think you're an international treasure. <laughs> oh, I am, you just I am, too kind. I am honored to know you. I'm, I've been honored to know mm. you for all these years. I love your songs. I've mm. tried to cover your songs. I just can't bloody sing them. Uh -huh. and, and well, we get together. You play them, and I'll sing them. <laughs> that, that works. We did that in Palm Springs. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here today. Thank oh. you for being such a wonderful friend and such a wonderful friend to Gibson. He's very um, kind. And um, this has been an, uh, another episode of the conversation <laughs> here at the wonderful Gibson Lounge and Showroom in beautiful. Los Angeles, California. Yeah, oh. My guest has been Terry Reed. Yeah. My name is Joe Bonamassa. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Thank you.